morning. Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland Devo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays at 9 a.m. And if you're in the neighborhood, we'd love to have you come by and join us here with the rest of us. And after the Devo, we take a few minutes and pray for the needs of the body and for anyone else that may post a, a need. So if you have a, a need there, you can post it and we will pray for you. <coughs> Today we will begin a new book. The book will be in uh, Philippians, and we'll look at a little bit of the history of Philippians and then get into the, the first chapter. So if you have your Bibles, grab it with a cup of coffee, a pen, a highlighter, and just let the Lord minister to you this morning as we begin our, our day. Let's go ahead and pray. Oh, gracious Father, we... We humbly come before you this morning, Lord, giving you thanks, giving, Father, for such a beautiful day, Lord, for waking us up and being faithful that even when we're sleeping, Lord, your protection is upon us. We know Peter said very clearly in, in his little epistle there in chapter 5 that we have an enemy that's like a roaring lion, and he just roars around seeking who he may devour. <clears throat> and I don't know about him, but... If I had an enemy, I would probably try to attack when they're asleep, when they're defenseless. And I just thank you, Lord, that you are always awake. Amen. And you have your angels protecting and guiding us, Lord. That's enough, Lord, to help us to rejoice and give you thanksgiving this morning. So minister to us now, Lord, as we get into your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So good morning again. Thank you for joining us. So we're in the book of uh, Philippians, and we'll be doing chapter 1 here, which has quite a bit, but we'll get through it. But I want to give you just a little bit of a background to the book of Philippians. And each, each letter that the apostles write, they write to a certain place, certain person, certain church, and, and there's specific areas that they're writing about. Uh, doesn't mean that it doesn't apply to us because the Word of God is alive, sharper than any twisted sword. And so it will minister to us. It will, it will divide our hearts uh, from our intents. And it's good because it gets us right with God so that God can continue to, to bless us and not withheld His, His grace from us. <clears throat> so Philippians was a town in the northern area of Greece in the territory called Mesodania. So it was a small little town there uh, in Greece. So you had Greek people that occupied that area. Its ancient name was Keredis until it was rebuilt and fortified by Philip II of Macedon. And he was the father of Alexander the Great. So that's how far back it, this little town went. Uh, Philip uh, had foreseen the potential economic and strategic significance of the city. And when the uh, Turchians endangered it, he took the city in 356 uh, BC and renamed it after himself. So that's where we get the word Philip, Philippi, Philippians, and so forth. So it actually came from Alexander the Great's ancestry. Although it was a small town in size, Philip was important for two reasons. Its proximity to the Mount of uh, Paganus, and known for its gold and silver deposits. So there was a, a lot of wealth there. So this city was a wealthy city. And it's also its location, both on the Via Agnita, which ran from Byzantium to the west coast of Greece, and near Nepalus, a port city uh, with avenues to the sea. So everything seemed to be set up for that city to just have influx of people, influx of retail, exports, imports, various things, and it's probably what made it so so wealthy. And women played a prominent role in the leadership of the Christian church and there in Philippi. Lydia, whose entire household were baptized, uh, hosted by Paul and his colleagues, and her home became a center for the church. So interesting that one of the prominent Christians there is a woman. We see nothing's changed today. Oftentimes it's women who are running ministries. I know in this ministry, most of our ministries is run by women. 
and we don't really have men that have stepped up to it. And we shake our heads, but it's a shame. Yeah. It's really a shame that no, one's, no one has stepped up to take those positions. We can agree with it or disagree with it, but we need guys that will step up to the plate and actually do the work uh, of uh, the ministry. So here's a, a woman who opens up her house and people are getting saved and, and God is using her in a great way. Furthermore, you have uh, Judas and Psychicus obviously have key roles to play in the life of the community there. Uh, whatever became of the healed slave girls is unknown, but two other women that were prominent in the ministry, and, and Paul mentions them. Uh, Paul's initial visit to Philippi and the Philippian church members maintained ties with the apostle by sending him gifts. Uh, when he was in Thessalonica, they repeated support for also his work, Philippians 4, 1, 16. And again, while he was in Corinth, uh, brothers from Macedonia supplied his needs, 2 Corinthians eleven nine, And more recently, Aphrodite uh, risked his own life to bear in bearing the service that the Philippians could not in person supply. So this church was very wealthy, and it was a generous church that helped out Paul in his missionary trips to Jerusalem. Uh, and if uh, they could, they would give their very lives to Paul. Uh, we can outline this basically in four sections. Uh, the single-minded Christian. We're going to see that in chapter 1, uh, how single-minded they were. They were focused. They were determined to preach the gospel, to further it uh, in faith that God would spread it throughout Philippians. And then their submissive mind in chapter 2. They were submitted to Christ, to Paul, to Timothy, and Aphroditus. Uh, they submitted themselves to the leadership. And then they were spiritually minded in chapter 3. We'll see how, how spiritual they were in the past, the present, and even in the future, how they had faith and trust in God. And they were also secured in mind in chapter 4. They had peace, they had power, and they had provisions. So we'll see that in our study of Philippians the next four times that we meet. So let's go ahead and and read chapter 1, as Paul is writing around 62 AD, uh, written from Rome. We can find it in Acts chapter 28 through 30, when Paul referenced the Philippians. So he starts his letter as he usually does, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, or Jesus Christ, to all the saints, that is, those who were set apart unto God in Christ Jesus, who are in Philippi with the bishops and the deacons. So he's writing to all the saints in Philippi and also the leadership, the bishops and the deacons, the pastors, assistant pastors, the elders uh, that were there in Philippi. And he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you with all joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day on." Till now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Uh, I, I love that. So his, his entrance there is one of grace, one of peace for them, uh, one of prayer for them, and then also being confident that the Lord who has begun a good work in them was going to complete it. Now that's something that we should be encouraged by, is that God begun a good work in you and he will be faithful to complete it. Now we have to remember that it's God's work and not our work. We can't build ourselves up. We can't seek him. We can't uh, better ourselves. That comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. We have to surrender ourselves to Christ. That in itself is enough for us to do. It is God's work that begun in us, and it will be God's work that will, be, will complete us. And we have to remember that. When we fail, <clears throat> when we fall short, don't get discouraged. Pick yourself up and get back to work. You know, Don't let the enemy discourage you. Don't let the outside pressures uh, discourage you. Stay focused. Get yourself up and get going because God has begun a good work. He's faithful to complete it. Now in work... When work is being done, you have setbacks, you have problems, you have situations that arise. That's always the case in anything, in everything. You're going to be doing a project at work, and you're going to have some troubles, and you have to adjust yourself. You have to fix those areas and then continue on with work. You don't give up and you don't quit. Can you imagine if they start building the space shuttle, 
uh, and, and they decided, well, phew, we just can't do this, and they quit. No, they didn't quit. They kept trying over and over and over again until they succeeded. And so we have to keep getting up and just surrendering our lives to Christ. He's the one that begun the work. He is the one that's going to complete it. And we have to put our faith in that. Look, if you're trying to complete your own walk with Christ, you're going to be miserable. Yeah. You're going to be grumpy. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to realize, I can't do this, Lord. He's like, thank you. I've been waiting for you to say that. Now I can do a work. Just trust in me. Just surrender your life to me. So it's him who begun that work, and it's him who is going to complete it. And then he says in verse 7, Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. Now, I like that. All of you are partakers. Of, we're all partakers of grace, every one of us. We're here by grace. We are alive by grace. We work by grace. Everything is by grace. It's not by our works of righteousness, but it's according to His grace and our faith in Him. We have to remember that. And, verse 9, This I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and in discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruit of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now you would think, as much as the Philippians were doing, you know, they were wealthy, they were prosperous, uh, they probably uh, were a rich church and had abundance. You would think that Paul would have said, hey, you're doing enough. Don't worry about doing more. But what did he say? Now that you've done more, I want you to abound even more. I want you to do more, and, and then more, in knowledge and in discernment uh, that you may approve. So continue to grow is what he's saying here. Continue to grow in your wisdom and understanding of Christ and your service and your work. It's always about growth. Don't be stagnant. Don't get in a rut where you're working and you're serving and you're like, okay, I got this thing and it's comfortable. Now I can just maintain it. No, no, no. Now you've got to think about it how you can better it. I'm always doing that. Whenever I start something, I, I, I learn it and I figure it out and then I start doing this routine. And once I got the routine down, then I step back and I look at it, how can I better it now? How can I make it more efficient? How can I make it so that we can do it a little faster? You know, and so forth. Like this morning I was, I was doing some uh, administration work and it was a little tedious uh, uh, doing some uh, uh, payments and, and deposits and things like this. And so I thought it'd be nice if I just had an Excel sheet that I can just fill in, boom, 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 and it's done. Instead of writing it all by hand, every time in a form and so <laughs> forth, and you know. And so I'm thinking I'm gonna make myself an Excel sheet, have a form there and just fill it out. And it's quick and easy. And then when I go to reference it, it's right there on the spot. So it's always growing more and more in our relationship with Christ in all aspects of it. Now he goes on in verse 12. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. And what an attitude, right? What an attitude. The things that happened to me. Now, if you were to read about Paul, uh, he would probably tell you that a lot has happened to him. Uh, he has been through so much in his a walk with the Lord that it is ridiculous uh, what he has uh, been through. Um, I was hoping to find uh, where he talks about the ministry here in chapter 4 of, uh, of Corinthians. And he talks about all the deceitfulness uh, that was against him. darkness. Anyway, so he talks about the pressure that's coming around him, the attacks and uh, the beatings, uh, the shipwrecks, and all of these things that, that he has been through. And he has been through a lot. And yet he could say, but it's for the furtherance of the gospel. You, know, well, you might be in an attack right now. And you might feel like it's overwhelming. It's too much for you to bear. But obviously God has given you enough to bear with his help and you can get through that with his help 
And you can stand afterwards like Paul and say, this is for the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, if we quit, and people do that, they quit right away. Things get hard, they quit. Uh, things don't work out the way they want them to work out, they quit. I was reading a, um, a little article by Paul Tripp this morning, and he talked about independence. You know, independence is coming up tomorrow. You can go to my my post, and you'll read it there. I really encourage you to read it. He just did an excellent job again. But he talked about how we're always thinking about independence. We got our independence from England. He says, but when you get independence, independence always has a tendency of leading into slavery. When we try to get independence for ourselves, we end up enslaving ourselves. What we need to have is dependence upon God. But we're always trying to get independence for ourselves. Independence out of things. Now, let me give you an example of this. Look at uh, how we got our independence from England, but look at our government today and how we're dependent <laughs> upon our government. Slavery. So independence isn't always great. I'm not saying that God didn't orchestrate the independence of our great nation, but man has brought us to a point where now people are dependent upon the government. And they shouldn't be dependent on the government. They should be dependent on Christ. Now, we do the same thing spiritually. We're always trying to get our independence. You know, and independence basically says, I have a free will, and you can't tell me what to do. I don't care if you're a pastor. I don't care if you're my boss. I don't care if you're my husband. You know, I don't care if you're my father and my parents. I'm independent. I can think for myself. And that will always lead to slavery. And see, independence means I quit. You know, whatever it is that I'm doing, I quit. I stop. I can't persevere. I'm not going to work through this. It's too much for me. So I want my independence from that. And then you quit and you get into what? A lot of times nothing. You just go back to living your life, you know, and you're not doing anything for the Lord. And so that becomes slavery to your lifestyle. Mm. And again, that's, that is idolatry because you're creating yourself as a God. You're doing what you want to do and not surrendering yourself to the Lord. So uh, it's important to understand those things. Paul said, look, uh, I am surrendered to Christ and whatever happens to me is for the furtherance of the gospel. He goes on in verse 13. So that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to the rest that my chains are in Christ and most of the brethren in the Lord having become confident in my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. And, and so the brethren saw the boldness of, of Paul, so they got bold. They said, if Paul can do this, I can do this. We were sharing in our discipleship class about the persecution that's going to come upon pastors here in the future, especially on... Uh, the subject of homosexuality, the gay and lesbian agenda, and how they're going to literally come after them if they teach or disagree with that lifestyle. And the question was asked me, what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to preach it. If it's in the Bible, I'm going to preach it. I'm going to go back to Leviticus. Amen. I'm going to go to Romans, and I'm going to, to preach the truth. It's not going to be a, a main topic or a subject, but as it comes through the Bible, as as we hear news of it in our society, in our community, you know, I'm going to talk about it because these are issues that we should talk about. I think it's very biblical to talk about these things. Um, so as they come up, I may be in prison and pastors may be in prison. And I think what that's going to do, that persecution is going to embold the body of Christ. And they're going to get bold and say, well, if you're going to put him in prison, you better put me in prison. Yes. And they're going to preach the gospel. And it may cause a revival to take place in the land. So the persecution may be an opportunity for the furtherance of the gospel. So we have to view it that way, as Paul did. Now, he goes on. Some indeed preach Christ even from envy, strife. Some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambitions, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. That's Paul's call. I am to defend the gospel. Now, when he says I am to defend, uh, he is not literally saying that I defend the fact that it's true. He just defends what he believes in. God will defend the truth of it. 
Uh, that's God's job. And we are to defend uh, what God has entrusted to us. What then, verse 18, only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. So at least Christ is being preached, no matter how it's being preached. I, and I pray that, that we understand that. You might not be a pastor, you might not be a theologian, you might have limited knowledge, but at least you're preaching the gospel. Preach it however way you can, with whatever information you have, preach it. Now, even if you just go up to someone and say, I don't understand it, all I know is that once I was lost, but now I'm saved, <laughs> and I'm content and at peace knowing that I'm going to heaven. And for me, hallelujah, that's enough. And you never know, someone might want that peace too. There have been many of people who have come to the Lord because of the peace that was in someone else. And they didn't have that peace. So he said, rejoice. Now let's move on to 19. For I know that this will turn out for my salvation through your prayers and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. According to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For me, or for to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. So that's where we get that famous scripture. You know, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. In other words, we live on this earth like Christ. He was persecuted, we will be persecuted. If we die like Christ, we will be resurrected at the sound of the trumpet, and, and present from the Amen. absent from this body is present with the Lord, and that's our hope and glory. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart, to be with Christ, which is far better. Paul had a desire to be with Christ. He probably prayed every day, Lord, is it time today? <laughs> Lord, I'm ready to go. I'd love to be home with you now. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. It's not morbid. It's not a death wish. It's just you're homesick and it's time to go home. But we also have to understand, but not my will, Lord, your will be done. Amen. If, if you're not done with us, then continue to use us. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. See, what Paul was saying was, look, I'd rather go home because that would really benefit me. If I stay here, nothing benefits me, but it does benefit you because I can instruct you, encourage you, and strengthen you in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so he saw his life as one spilled out, spent over for someone else. He was truly an unselfish man, though Paul would say that this is a faithful and true testimony that Christ came to die for sinners, and yet I am the chief of sinners, he said in 1 Timothy 3.16. He goes on in verse 25, And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ, by my coming to you again. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, uh, of their loss, of their being not believers, but to you of salvation and that from God. Um, that little section is something we should memorize. Because Paul is really encouraging us to be of one mind. He said, we're to stand together. We're not to fight against each other. We're to encourage each other, not batter against each other. We should be strengthening each other, not weakening and destroying each other. This is what his, his hope is. We're one spirit. We're in, we're in the one faith, one mind. So we should be, be striving together for the faith of the gospel. That is the application here that we should be applying. Then he closes in verse 29. For to you, it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Oh, we don't like that, do we? Oh, it's wonderful. Oh, I'm saved. I get to go to heaven. And Jesus then says, yeah, but you're going to suffer now. No, 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 I don't want to suffer. I've had enough suffering in this life. No, now you're going to suffer. That's what he told Paul. He said, Paul, I have, have many things that you're going to suffer through. 
man, if somebody would have told me that when I started my ministry, I probably would not have gotten into it. <laughs> I would have stayed in my job, but no one ever told me that. This is a per pretty clear scripture that says it's appointed to you to suffer. You listen to the faith and wealth doctrine and they're saying, no, you don't have to suffer. God has made you healthy, wealthy. You need to blab it. You need to grab it. You know, you need to name it and claim it type of thing. You know, if God doesn't want you sick and yet Paul had a thorn in his side. Timothy was sick of his stomach and these were men of faith. So they're not reading the whole scripture of God. It says we will suffer, guys. We will suffer. Amen. If you're suffering right now, I get it. Believe me, it's not easy. It's difficult, it's hard, but you have to arise above that through the power of the Holy Spirit. You have to make the choice to rejoice in the Lord, that it's for the furtherance of the gospel. It's a testimony and a witness of your strength in Christ. If you're walking around with a sob sober face, somber face, you know, and you're sad, then something's wrong with your faith. You need to put it in Christ. I'm not trying to discourage you. I'm trying to encourage you. Think positive. Trust in God. Realize it's for the furnace of the gospel. If Christ suffered on the cross, so should we suffer on the cross. I always like that one scene in the Passion of the Christ when Mary comes to him while he's carrying the cross, you know, and she's crying and weeping. And Jesus turns to her and says, Mother, you know, he's carrying this cross. His, his head is bleeding from the thorns. His face is, is bruised and, he, and unrecognizable. His beard was plucked out. You know, he looks at it and says, Mother, Mother, look, I'm making all things new. And he's like <laughs> excited. And Mary's like, you're beaten up. What, what do you mean? You know, she didn't get it. But Christ got it, you know. He got it. Look, I'm suffering. I get that. But that's okay. I'm making everything new for everyone. And we need to have that attitude like Christ understanding that so he ends in verse 30 having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here is in me so like Paul uh, suffered he said you will also suffer and you know that you've seen it and so expect it but rejoice in the Lord because absent from the body is present with the Lord. Amen? Yes, amen? Let us pray. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for your precious word, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that you have given us the power and the ability, Lord, to suffer through things, Lord. That the Christian life is not an easy life. It is not a life that just comes without problems, without situations, without growth, Lord. If it was, Father, we would be all spoiled little brats, Lord. <laughs> But Lord, it's a, it's a life of suffering, Lord. And we need to learn to suffer, Lord. Would you teach us to suffer? Mm -hmm. Not that we will want added suffering, Lord, but whatever it is that we're suffering at right now at this moment, teach us, Lord, to persevere through it. Truly, Lord, yes. the sign of a, a strong Christian is one who perseveres, Father, not one who lacks and steps behind. Father, like the children of Israel, as they were entering the promised land, the enemy picked off those Christians that lacked behind. They didn't persevere. Uh, they were ready to quit. Uh, they threw in the towel. Uh, and so the enemy came behind just picking them off. And you're talking millions of people traveling and they didn't even realize it. And so Moses began to pray to the Father. And Ben, uh, or her and Joshua, lifted up his arms in prayer, asking for strength as they battled the enemy, Lord. May we have strength today, Lord, as we battle the enemy. We thank you for these wonderful words today, the encouragement, Father, that you have given us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, hopefully, if you have no church, come and join us tonight, Wednesday at 7 p.m. We will be going through the book of Numbers, chapter 8. Love to have you. Love to meet you here. Have a wonderful day.